All right, how's everybody doing? Yeah, uh, come on, there's like 250 people in this room, right? How are you doing? <laughs> Much better. Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Jeff Kleza. I am the Director of Innovation at AMI, the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. So really excited to come and talk to you guys today. We've been doing a bit of a road show here through Calgary, so this is our last stop before I drive back tonight. So hopefully I can keep the energy going. Um, I asked Drew to give me five minutes to do a little uh, shout out for Amy. He uh, gave me a half an hour. So uh, yeah, I get, guess I get to uh, bore you to tears then. It's going to be awesome. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Amy first. And then uh, we have a, a VIP who's going to speak briefly. And then uh, I'll go on and I've got a list of uh, things to do before you get involved in machine learning. And I understand, I mean, most of you in this room probably know way more than I do. So uh, feel free to call uh, shenanigans on me whenever it, it is appropriate. Um, so we'll skip the two middle sections because it's probably just going to be stuff you already know. All right, so Amy, fun facts. So the University of Alberta is actually top five in the world for artificial intelligence research. Uh, we've got some immense credibility, some awesome people working there. The problem is, is historically most of our grads have left the province after they finished their training, right? So this is a problem. So the reason Amy exists is we want to make Alberta not only the premier destination for foundational research, but also for applied research. The way we're doing that is we're working with companies in four different areas. So we're going to continue to support the world-class foundational research going on at the University of Alberta. It's paramount. That's what got us here in the first place, and we're going to make sure that keeps happening. So my program, the Innovation Affiliates Program, we're here to grow machine intelligence capacity and capability in businesses in Alberta. We're also here to help attract businesses to the uh, location or to, uh, to Edmonton and to the U of A to help, do, help them do uh, advanced applied research as well in artificial intelligence. Uh, we want to help connect global innovators. We still want, we want Alberta to be this world leading destination. We want companies to recognize that Toronto isn't the only city in Canada. And we want to boost machine intelligence literacy in businesses. Uh, we're doing this through programs like this ML1 101 presentation. We have a number of different workshops. We're working on a machine learning certification program. Uh, unlike the U of C's data analytics program at the master's level, we're talking about a continuing education level. We want to train machine learning technicians, so to speak. So we want to take people who already have STEM degrees and help them transition into machine learning. That program, I have some more at the, uh, information about that at the end. Uh, but yeah, so, so some pretty boastful words up here, right? And you're saying, Jeff, who the hell are you? Well, these are the people who back those statements. These are our Amy researchers. We have people on there like Richard Sutton, one of the pioneers of a technique called reinforcement learning. Rich Sutton's book on reinforcement learning is considered the seminal publication in computing science. Pretty awesome, eh? Yeah. <laughs> well, you didn't have to clap, but that's great. Uh, we have Michael Bowling, Solves Poker, uh, Texas No Limit Hold, uh, Texas No Limit Hold'em Poker. I got that wrong. Uh, anyway, Solve the Game. Randy Goebel has uh, um, uh, an AI system that can pass the Japanese bar exam. Uh, Yutaka Yasui uh, won an award for a, uh, a, an assay using machine learning to um, diagnose tuberculosis in Southeast Asia. Uh, saves a lot of lives, very cost effective assay, keeps the health workers safe. Um, who else we got in here? Anyways, lots of great minds, lots of really brilliant researchers there. And, and ostensibly, when we look, we see Richard Sutton, who trained Michael Bowling, who trained Martha White. We see three generations of researchers there. So this is a community of people who really care about what they're doing and are passionate about what they're doing, and they're still here. We haven't suffered from the massive brain drain like Carnegie Mellon when Uber came in and decimated their computer science staff. Our scientists stuck around. When Google DeepMind came knocking at the door, they said, we're not moving to London. If you want to work with us, you have to come to Edmonton. And Google DeepMind opened their first office outside of London in Edmonton. So some pretty awesome things. So I'll just touch briefly about the Innovation Affiliates program and how we work with companies. Um, we have a range of services that we're offering. And they center really around advisory services, scientific mentorship, and research support. So what we want to do is we want to help companies essentially de-risk their research activities when they're incorporating machine learning into their products and services. 
Initially, the first companies we want to work with are companies who have some internal capability for doing data science. They already have some staff in place. They have good data sets and good understanding of what they're doing. Obviously, right? A limited capacity, so as we get started and as we start to grow, we want to work with some of the companies who are ready to do this. As we expand out, we're going to be looking at working with more and more companies. So we should be able to help companies anywhere along the journey uh, in machine learning. So right from the neophyte companies, through workshops and group training sessions and other programs, we can help them get up to speed, all the way up to large companies who are doing cutting edge advanced, uh, or advanced cutting edge, same thing. Uh, it's been a long two days. <laughs> uh, really advanced applied research. So this is providing uh, PhD grade, uh, PhD level researchers to help them solve some of the world's leading applied problems in machine learning. Uh, so that's the introduction to Amy. Who's, uh, who am I pointing to? <laughs> ah. Oh, it's okay. It gives me a chance to get a drink of water. Right. Uh, so I am Brian Malcolmson. I am the Minister of Service Alberta. If you don't know what Service Alberta is, that means I have nailed my job. You most likely would have run into uh, my ministry if anyone here has uh, gone into a registry agency and they have got a license plate with uh, um, driver's license. So, you know, I, I guess the question naturally is, why is the Minister of License Plates at an AI conference? <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, a bit more time to fill. So, uh, okay, we're not going to talk about this. We're going to talk about this. Okay, so just really briefly, uh, before we move into the deeper parts, 
Um, just want to talk a little bit about how we think about machine learning. So machine learning, in a sense, is what we're trying to do is we're trying to model human knowledge, right? And so what is knowledge? So we take this from um, uh, information management theory, right? So we have data. We convert data into information. We consume information. Uh, we map the information we have to the knowledge that we have, and that's going to drive our actions. And our actions are going to result in outcomes, right? So the concept is, is that if, uh, if we only have the data and the information, then we're doing data analytics, right? We're doing unsupervised learning. We're trying to gain some insights. We're trying to turn as much of that data into information for consumption. But if we have our inputs and we've taken actions and we know what the outcomes of that is, we now have a labeled data set. We have our inputs. We have the labeled outcomes. Now we can create a model that can predict the outcomes given a new input data, right? So within knowledge, we break that down into two categories. So knowledge is broken down into prediction, which is sort of the empirical side of, of what we do, the numerical side. And we have judgment. Judgment's the softer side, right? The analogous thinking, the, the improvisation, the, the you know, uh, being able to uh, interpret things a, a little bit differently, right? So when we look at that, machine learning is really good at the prediction part, but it's really lousy at the judgment part. So we'll come back to that in a minute. So that's our quick overview. Um, Oh yeah, that's why. This is why you need domain expertise when you're uh, doing uh, unsupervised learning, right? Yeah. Okay. So seven things you need to know when implementing machine learning. So number one, define your problem. And everyone's like, ah, oh, God, Jeff, come on, you're so obvious. Of course you define your problem. But I think as human beings, we tend not to do this, right? We want to jump right to the answers. Who's read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Lots of people, right? So what was the ultimate answer? 42. And what was the ultimate question? Well, they had to build a bigger computer and wait 8 billion years to get the answer, right? So that's what human beings do. We want the answers to things. We don't want to necessarily think about the problems. Throughout history, as technology comes along, people believe that technology is there to answer their questions, not to give them, and not to help them understand the question better and ask better questions, right? So anybody know who Charles Babbage was? Yeah, a few people. Father, um, basically the father of the computer, right? So Charles Babbage back in the 1700s built the difference machine, the big steam locomotive sized uh, um, machine that could do addition and subtraction, all these gears and cogs and stuff like that. So this is a quote, uh, apparently a quote from him. I found this on the internet, right? So it's gotta be, gotta be true. Uh, a quote from him uh, about basically, yeah, he's been asked by people, well, if I give you the wrong input, will it still give me the right answers, right? So throughout history, again, we have this tendency to just drive towards the answer without thinking about what the right question is. When it comes to machine learning, you have to know what question you're trying to answer. Number two, machine intelligence projects involve very little machine learning, right? And everybody in this room has probably wrangled data. And you know if you're going to do some modeling, you're probably going to spend 90% of your time wrangling data. And when you look in the grand scheme of things, you know, by the time you've figured out why you're doing machine learning, what problem it is you're trying to solve. You define that problem. You go and source where you're going to get your data from. You take your time to understand that data, label the data, get everything ready. Now you can model, right? So you do some modeling. It takes you about like half a day. You're all done. It's awesome. You got some good models. And now you got to figure out how to put the thing into production. You got to go, you got to lock down your data pipelines. You got to secure your data inputs. You got to figure out how to audit this model and make sure it's doing the right things and isn't going to break on you and cause you all kinds of problems. So in other words, if you go out and you spend a bunch of money and you hire the best data scientist or machine learning scientist that money can buy, and she comes into your office, you're probably going to frustrate that person if you haven't done all the rest of this homework first, right? Economics count. So as an engineer, I really subscribe to this, right? So if I do something more than twice, I want to automate it, because I never want to do it again, right? So then I start automating it, and then I got to deal with all the edge cases in that automation, and then I start chasing those problems down, and then before I know it, I forgot what I was automating in the first place, and uh, yeah, so, but the thing about this is, this is really what you encounter when you're doing machine learning, right? Rarely do you get the features right the first time around. You're always going to have to go back to the drawing board. You're always going to need to do things to improve your models, to optimize those models. You're constantly going to iterate and cycle. So even though the cost of computing, the cost of storage, the cost of data, these are all dropping fast, the time it takes to create accurate models that work well 
still takes a lot of human horsepower, right? So you have to have a good economic goal. The technology doesn't change the economics. Make sure this is something that, that has some, some large scale viability for your organization. You may encounter some smaller problems that you can tackle and ship off along the way, uh, but overall, to justify the big investment an organization's gonna make in doing machine learning, make sure it's a big problem you're trying to solve. Start simple. Uh, so the comic there, uh, has anybody seen this comic before? It's, it's pretty popular, I think. But anyway, so it says, the, uh, thanks to machine learning algorithms, the robot apocalypse was short-lived. And you've got the warrior in the back going, man, that, that was over pretty quick. And then we have the scientist in the front, and she's saying, well, no, it kind of makes sense, because when you look throughout history, most battles were won with, with pre-modern uh, weapons, right? So the robot overlords, like through the biases in the data, learned that they should fight with uh, clubs and spears instead of like machine guns and tanks, right? And these are the things, these are the biases in your data are the things that are gonna catch you. So if anybody's worked with neural networks, you understand that neural networks are kind of a black box. You take your data set, you train the neural network. These things are really powerful. Deep learning is really awesome, don't get me wrong. But after you're done training, it is what it is, right? If it doesn't work, you gotta kinda scrap it and start over with some new features, some new data maybe. Um, so if you jump right into deep learning, you could be interpreting some, uh, or, or you could be inheriting some problems in your data that you never even knew existed. So a couple of examples of this. So when IBM first started using neural networks to train uh, Deep Blue to play chess, they went out and they trained this thing up with all the great chess matches in history, right? And then said, ah, oh, this seems to be working pretty good. Let's go play some chess. And they get out there and uh, Deep Blue makes its move and the chess master makes his move and then Deep Blue makes another move and the chess master makes his move. And then Deep Blue sacrifices the queen. And all the engineers are like, no, what, what happened? What the, this, this can't be right. Why would you sacrifice the queen? But they go back and they look at the data and the data kind of bears that out, right? Some of the best chess matches in history were won with queen sacrifices. So what does the computer learn? It learns that queen sacrifices usually result in a game win, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's the signal it gets. Um, COPD, so there's a researcher out of the University of Washington called Rich Caruana. And back in the late 90s, Rich was experimenting with some neural networks and he wanted to do a project where he could help uh, clinical triage of pneumonia patients. So in other words, how do we make sure the pneumonia patient gets the right care at the right time in their treatment? So he gets all of the best scientists at the time with neural networks. He finds all of the best clinicians in pneumonia cases and pneumonia studies. He finds all the best data on uh, pneumonia patients and outcomes. And he gets them all into a room, stirs them all up, and creates some really awesome machine learning, right? So he's got a model, seems to be working like a hot dam. So he says, okay, well, let's, let's take this model and let's go out into the clinical trials and see how this performs. <clears throat> so they get the doctor in there, they get the clinician, then they wheel in the computer, and then they start inviting the patients in. So the first guy comes in and he's like, yeah, these are my symptoms. And the doctor says, hmm, interesting. Computer, what do you think? And the computer recommends a treatment, and the doctor says, hmm, yes, I concur, I concur. good computer, that's, that's awesome, great work. And he keeps going through, and the computer seems to be nailing it. Every time seems to be getting the right diagnosis or the right, the right uh, treatment for the patient. And then all of a sudden, an asthmatic patient walks in the door. And the doctor looks at her and says, all right, give me your symptoms. She explains what's going on. The doctor looks at the computer, says, computer, what do you think? And the computer says, she's fine, send her home. And the doctor's like, what? No, no, you get into hospital bed now, right? And so again, th there's this weird problem. So they go back to the data and they look to try to understand what was going on. And the data does bear this out. As it turns out, asthmatics have an incredibly low mortality rate from pneumonia. Right? Most likely it's because they have a good relationship with their doctors and their doctors care if they're able to breathe. So if an asthmatic walks in to see their doctor with some chest problems, the doctor's probably gonna say, let's get you in a hospital bed right away and get you on the best care. So again, these data biases that we maybe don't see or we interpret them one way or the machine learning is gonna interpret them another way. So if you think about that, if you start with uh, that type of a data set and you jump right into deep learning, you run the risk of never seeing these biases until it's too late. So start simple. Don't jump into deep learning right off the bat. No one cares about your algorithm, right? <laughs> really. Most of the algorithms we're using today were invented 30, 40 years ago, right? All these mathematical techniques, they've been around forever. We just have the computing horsepower to do them at scale with big data sets. But the reality, too, is, is the machine learning algorithm itself 
the, uh, the, it's not going to be the thing that makes or breaks your model. The success of your model is most likely determined by your data. It's all about the data. Marty Zinkovich is a researcher with Google. So this is out of his uh, uh, paper, Rules of Machine Learning, Best Practices for Machine Learning Engineering. Great document, if you haven't read it, go search it out. It's got about 40 rules of machine learning. Fantastic document. But he even says it best, right there. It's your features, not your models. Uh, know the cost of wrong, especially if you're trying to automate, right? No machine learning model is perfect. If you're getting 100% accuracy with your model, it memorized your training data, right? It hasn't generalized, so it's not gonna work very good. That means it's going to have error. When you're putting this out in the field, you better understand what happens if your model makes a mistake, because it's going to make mistakes. So I don't know if anybody's seen a table like this. this is a risk analysis framework, right? You put your risks on the grid based on the probability of the risk of the thing happening, and then the impact if it does happen. And you kind of plot this out. So up in the top left, the green boxes, that's pretty safe stuff. That's like, oh, I predicted that it was going to, you know, not going to rain today. You didn't take an umbrella, and then you got wet. Not such a bad outcome. The red box down there is, you know, if it's a, a likely event, but it's extremely harmful, like what happens if an asthmatic patient walks in and the clinician tells them to go home, right? Someone could die. So do the risk assessment. Know what's going to happen. And remember, too, if your model's 99% accurate, and it's making a decision a million times a day, it's gonna get it wrong 10,000 times, right? So again, it's gonna get it wrong. Uh, and the final point, so this is the, the happy ending, right? Machine learning and humans tend to work best together. And this comes back to that prediction judgment problem, right? So the machine learning can handle the prediction tasks at volume at speed without error, whereas the humans can kind of put their judgment back into it. So this comes from a, a study on metastatic breast cancer biopsies. So this is where we've taken the, the biopsy slide. We've put it, out, uh, put it on the slide. The, the pathologist can look at the, the cells. And they've used computer vision models to train the machine intelligence to do a diagnosis, right? So the pathologist, still the best, 96.6% correct. The in machine intelligence model, 92.6% or 92.5% correct diagnosis. But when the pathologist uses the prediction from the machine intelligence model, as an input into their decision-making process, he's getting it right 99.5% of the time. So that's an 85% decrease in the human error rate. So that's, that's pretty amazing, right? So this is a really good news story. Um, so what it really means is, is the future isn't really machine learning coming and taking away all our jobs. The future of machine learning is about it helping us do our jobs better, right? Making smarter decisions, working more efficiently, getting rid of some of the mundane stuff that we do. So another technological paradigm or, or analogy to this, back in 1979 when they invented the spreadsheet, there were four, about 400,000 actuarials employed in the US, right? And so everybody saw this spreadsheet coming out and they're like, oh my God, this is going to replace all of these actuarials. We're going to have 400,000 accountants running amok in the streets with nothing to do. And you know what accountants are like when they're bored. This is gonna be mayhem, right? Did accountants lose their jobs? Well, maybe some, but by and large, most of the accountants kept doing their work. And what the spreadsheet allowed them to do, it allowed them to do their work better, faster, more accurately. So they were able to do higher level functions, right? So instead of just bookkeeping, they were able to now do financial planning and budgeting and strategic planning. So again, the tools, the technology allows them to do more advanced work and better work. So that's the end of the uh, uh, presentation there. I will let you know, so uh, I talked about the machine learning certification program. So that's being launched uh, out of uh, the University of Alberta Faculty of Extension. Uh, the first series of courses are starting in April. So April, May, and June will be the first, uh, the first three course series. Um, the overall program is probably gonna end up being about a two to 300 hour uh, course program. We're still working on finalizing the curriculum. So this launches in Edmonton uh, in, the, in the spring. We'll be bringing it to Calgary here in the fall, and we'll be looking to expand that uh, offering through other post-secondary institutions. So that's everything I wanted to talk about, but I will open the floor to any questions you may have. Yes? How do they engage? Yeah, 
So what the question was is how do companies engage with Amy, regardless of their size? Well, first you can connect with us at Hello at Amy. Our community engagement team will get a hold of you. Uh, we do a series of Hello Amy presentations. So these are presentations that explain that engagement model a little bit better. So the first step is to come out to the, uh, uh, to the Hello Amy session, get to know the engagement process. If you think it's a fit, you'll get an application form. You can fill out the application form, and then we'll assess you. And uh, you know, obviously, there's more demand than we have resources to, to s cater to. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to make sure that somewhere, someone in the community will be able to help you. Any other questions? Oh. oh. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah the money <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, so for, from a startup perspective, what we generally do with startups is we focus on the scientific mentorship mostly. The, start, the startup, uh, startups are free. So startups, if you're a pre-revenue uh, startup, uh, we will work with you for free. We'll do our best to provide you with scientific mentorship. We'll basically work with you to de-risk the machine learning components you're doing. We try not to get involved in any way, shape, or form in, in delivering on a MVP for a startup because that's a very highly risky kind of area to be dealing in. Um, but yeah, so the, the goal is to, to de-risk companies. And then for, for larger tiers, we do charge money. Uh, we do have a model that we want to be scalable and sustainable. Uh, if we took all of the money the government gave us and just used it to service companies, then at some point we're just going to run out of capacity, run out of money, and then we have to stop helping people, right? The model has to be scalable and sustainable. So that's why we do charge uh, post-revenue companies. Yes, it will be coming to Calgary in September. So how, how is that? How is that uh, it's it's going to be, a, I think it's going to be a series of 10 courses, or 10 different courses, each of like, you know, probably three to five uh, days each. Um, so the, the total programming is, is probably in the neighborhood of about 300 hours. Including all the homework and labs. Um, no, <laughs> no. Soon though, soon you can you can see the details for the first three courses that we're offering. So those details are available, but the whole program the, we're still uh, developing the program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that, is that all the answer you're looking for? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Why would we come to Calgary? <laughs> My God, you guys don't, oh no, I won't even get into hockey. No, yes, yes, we are coming to Calgary. This is an Alberta-wide initiative. Uh, so part of why we're here, uh, uh, so Rafai, my compatriot there from, uh, from Amy, we're down talking to companies here over the last couple of days. Um, we will eventually be opening an office. We don't have a timeline for that. We think probably uh, fall to winter. And, uh, uh, but in the meantime, we will be continuing to come down here. Um, we do work with uh, Calgary-based companies already. Actually, one of the first people we enrolled in the IP program was a Calgary-based company. So, uh, so we've been doing that already, but we'll continue to travel back and forth until we have a more permanent establishment here. Uh, to an extent, a research capacity, so we'll have scientists here. We'll have uh, applied scientists probably at the master's level working out of this office. If you want to do more advanced research, though, just because we want to keep the proximity to the researchers at the University of Alberta, so if you want to do more advanced research, it'll probably be with scientists out of Edmonton. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.